Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Namaste. We carry forward our discussion on the Indian Penal Code and in this lecture we shall have a look at the general exceptions under the IPC. So what are these general exceptions? General exceptions are defenses that can be pleaded by a person who is accused of an offence. So basically if there is a person who is accused of doing an offence then this person can plead in the court of law that I did this offence because of such and such x, y, z reasons and because these reasons were beyond my control or because these reasons were justifiable or because these reasons are excusable, so I must not be treated as a criminal, I must not be punished. So these are the defences, the general exceptions are certain defences that can be pleaded by a person who is accused of an offence and they allow the accused to avoid criminal responsibility. These exceptions are covered under section 76 to 106 of the IPC and for all of these exceptions the burden of proof is on, on the accused as per section 105 of the Indian Evidence Act 1872. What do you mean by the burden of proof is on the accused? It means that the person who has been accused of committing the offence, he or she has to prove that there were certain circumstances because of which the criminal liability should be removed. Nobody else is going to prove that the accused himself or herself or his or her lawyer has to uh, prove the mitigating circumstances. So what is section 105 of the Indian Evidence Act? It says burden of proving that case of accused comes within exceptions. When a person is accused of any offence, the burden of proving the existence of circumstances bringing the case within any of the general exceptions in the Indian Penal Code or within any special exception or proviso contained in any other part of the same code or in any law defining the offence is upon him and the court shall presume the absence of such circumstances. That is, if the offender or the accused is unable to prove that there were these mitigating circumstances, the court is not going to assume these circumstances. The court is going to assume that there were no such circumstances and the court is going to proceed in the regular manner. Only when the accused proves that there were these mitigating circumstances will he or she get the benefit of these general exceptions. Illustrations A accused of murder alleges that by reason of unsoundness of mind he did not know the nature of the act. The burden of proof is on A. So basically if A is taking the defence that he did not know the nature of the act, he did not know that he was committing the murder because he had an unsound mind, then it is upon A to prove that he was in a situation of unsoundness of mind. A accused of murder alleges that by grave and sudden provocation, he was deprived of the power of self-control. Here again, the burden of proof is on A. A will have to prove that there was this grave and sudden provocation and it was of the nature that it deprived him of the power of self-control. Only then the court is going to accept this. Now there are two kinds of general exceptions. There are two kinds of defences. There are certain acts that can be excused and there are certain acts that can be justified. So what are these? <coughs> Excusable act. The accused will not be liable for an offence because he lacks the necessary mens rea 
for the offense due to existence of certain circumstances. So, what are these? Excusable acts say that the accused will not be liable for an offense because he lacks the necessary mens rea for the offense due to the existence of certain, certain circumstances. Now, as we have seen before, crime means actus reus plus mens rea. And if there is no mens rea, then there cannot be a crime. Now, what can be these circumstances where there is no mens rea? There can be things like mistakes of fact. The person was having a genuine impression that he is going to commit A, which is the right thing, but it turned out that A was in fact the wrong thing. That is a mistake of fact. It is not a mistake of law, it is a mistake of fact. So, there is a genuine uh, circumstance because of which A was thinking that he is doing the right thing, but he did the wrong thing. A very good example is the umbrella example that we saw before that you were having the impression that this is your umbrella when you were moving out of the class, but you took the umbrella of one of your classmates. Now, in this case, there is no mens rea. You did not have the intention to take that umbrella and this uh, error occurred because of a mistake of fact because you mistook somebody else's umbrella for your umbrella or things like incapacity. So, in the case of incapacity, the person can say that I was not in a position, I did not have the capability to think. For example, infancy. Now, infancy is a legal term which means that if an act is committed by a person who has a very young age, say a child below 7 years of age. Now, now, that child does not understand the consequences, he does not understand, he does not have a mind that can be a criminal mind. So, this is what is known as incapacity because of infancy. Similarly, there can be an incapacity because of insanity. So, there can be a mental condition or there can be incapacity because of intoxication. Say a person is so much drunk that he does not have the capability to think. Now, in this case, law also makes the distinction about whether this person got intoxicated because of his own volition or because of his own choice or this person was intoxicated because it was forcefully administered to him or because it was given to him by mistake or he took it by mistake. But whatever be the circumstances, intoxication will lead to an incapacity of thinking and in certain cases, it can be excused because especially in conditions where the person did not want to drink that alcohol and say it was given to him mixed with something else. So, in that case, the person can take this excuse or take this general exception that I had, I did not have the capacity to think because I was intoxicated and this intoxication was not because of my own acts. Or there can be things like accidents. So, in the case of accident, if something wrong occurs, it can be excused. So, in the case of excusable acts, the accused will not be liable for an offense because he lacks the necessary mens rea. In all of these cases, there is no mens rea. The, in this case, the person has made a genuine mistake of fact. In this case, the person was not in a position to create mens rea. And in this case, things occurred just because of accident and so there was no chance to make a mens rea. So, he lacks the necessary mens rea for the offense due to the existence of certain circumstances. Then we have justifiable acts. Here, the accused will not be liable for an offense because of the existence of certain circumstances which justify him in doing the act, although he knows that it is likely to cause harm. Now, in this case, the person has the, the capacity to think. The person knows that what he is doing is going to cause harm to others. 
but still there are certain circumstances that make it justifiable. So, you can justify. So, these are known as the justifiable acts. These circumstances include things like judicial acts, necessity of the situation, things done under consent, communication in good faith, things done under compulsion, trifles and private defense. So, for example, there is a situation where somebody comes and he is trying to murder you and to protect yourself, you act in self-defense and you say throw a piece of rock to that on that person and because of that rock, that person dies. Now, in this case, you did not have the intention to kill him, you did not have the mens rea, you were just acting in self-defense. So, this act can be justified. And things like these come under the category of general exceptions because these are justifiable acts. There are circumstances which justify in doing the act, although the person knows that it is likely to cause harm. Now, we will look at all of these exceptions in more detail by looking at the sections themselves. So, we will now look at the sections of IPC. Section 76 of IPC act done by a person bound or by mistake of fact believing himself bound by law. So, how do you read this sentence? You divide it into two pieces, act done by a person bound by law or act done by a person by mistake of fact believing himself to be bound by law. So, they, these are two different things. Nothing is an offense which is done by a person who is or who by reason of a mistake of fact and not by reason of a mistake of law in good faith believes himself to be bound by law to do it. So, there is a person who is bound by law to do something or this person thinks that or is under the impression that he is bound by law to do something and he does that. So, in those circumstances, the acts that are done are not offenses. Illustrations, A, a soldier fires on a mob by the order of his superior officer in conformity with the commands of the law. A has committed no offense. Now, in this case, A, who is the soldier, is firing on the mob because he is ordered by his superior officer. But here you must note that this order should be in conformity with the commands of the law. So, it should not be an illegal order. And if it is a legal order done because of this order of the superior officer, then even if people die upon firing, then too this person has not committed any offense. Similarly, A, an officer of a court of justice being ordered by that court to arrest Y and after due inquiry, believing Z to be Y, arrests Z. In this case, A has committed no offense because A is bound by the court of law and A is ordered by the court to arrest Y and he does all the due inquiry. Now, here these words after due inquiry have a lot of weight. If A just arrests any person casually, then he will not have the defense of this exception. But if he has done all the due inquiry, and even after doing all the inquiry that was possible at that time, he is he believes Z to be Y and arrests Z, then you would not say that he has committed an offense. Section 77, act of judge when acting judicially. Nothing is an offense which is done by a judge when acting judicially in the exercise of any power which is or which in good faith he believes to be given to him by law. Now, section 77 is saying that if a judge is acting because of the powers given to him by law, then whatever he does is justifiable. You cannot hold him accountable as an offense. So, for example, if the judge punishes somebody and later on it comes uh, into knowledge that this person was not the person who committed the crime. And so, this person was wrongly punished. But if the judge has followed all the procedures, 
then you will not hold the judge accountable for his act under the IPC. Next, we have act done pursuant to the judgment or order of court. Nothing which is done in pursuance of or which is warranted by the judgment or order of a court of justice, if done while such judgment or order remains in force, is an offence notwithstanding the court may have had no jurisdiction to pass such judgment or order, provided the person doing the act in good faith believes that the court had such jurisdiction. What does it mean? That the person who has been ordered by the court to do something and is doing that, it may come out later that that particular court did not have any jurisdiction to pass this judgment. It is possible that the court has made a mistake, but if this person who is doing the act is doing it in good faith and is under the impression or the belief that the court had such jurisdiction, so even though the act may be wrong, this person will not be held accountable. This person has will not be uh, called upon to say that he has committed an offence because he was acting in good faith. He was doing so because he believed that this is a court order and this is a rightful order. Now, here it is important to note that it is only for the act done in good faith and in the belief that the court had such a jurisdiction. Now, this becomes important because in a large number of cases, if you know that a particular court did not have the jurisdiction, then you will not have the relief of this section. Because in those cases, it will be your job to write to the court or to write to your superiors that probably this is a wrong order. So, these exceptions provide you with certain immunities, but these immunities also come with their own strings attached. Next, we have act done by a person justified or by mistake of fact believing himself justified by law. Nothing is an offence which is done by any person who is justified by law or who by reason of a mistake of fact and not by reason of a mistake of law in good faith believes himself to be justified by law in doing it. Illustration, A sees Z commit what appears to A to be a murder. So, Z is committing a murder and this is what A is saying. Now, as a good citizen, A in the exercise to the best of his judgment exerted in good faith of the power which the law gives to all persons of apprehending murderers in the fact seizes Z. So, A has caught Z in order to bring Z before the proper authorities. Now, in this case, A is acting in good faith. He is acting as a good citizen. So, he is thinking that I, am, I have seen this person commit a murder and so this person must be brought before the court of law. And because of that, A has caught Z. Now, if it turns out that uh, Z was acting in self-defense, then A will not be said to have committed an offence. So, A has committed no offence, though it may turn out that Z was acting in self-defence. Because A was acting in good faith and A was believing that he is justified by law in doing this act of catching hold of this person. So, in this case, A will not be held accountable. Another is section 80 accident in doing a lawful act. Nothing is an offence which is done by accident or misfortune and without any criminal intention or knowledge in the doing of a lawful act in a lawful manner by lawful means and with proper care and caution. Here again you can see this, the strings attached with proper care and caution. So, basically if the lawyer wants to uh, pull the strings, he can always say that the person did not act with proper care and caution. So, in all the exceptions or in most of the exceptions, you will find that there are certain strings attached. 
Example, A is at work with a hatchet. The head flies off and kills a man who is standing by. Here, if there was no want of proper caution on the part of A, his act is excusable and is not an offence. The important thing to note here is that there is no want of proper caution. That is, A, while he is working, he should have taken care that everything is fine, the head is not loose and probably he has put up the signs, he has ensured that there is nobody in the vicinity and even after doing all of these, some person gets into that area and the hatchet head, it gets loose and it flies off and kills that person. Only then will it count in the category of accident and then he will have the recourse to this exception. Section 81 act likely to cause harm, but done without criminal intent and to prevent other harm. Nothing is an offence merely by reason of its being done with the knowledge that it is likely to cause harm. If it be done without any criminal intention to cause harm and in good faith for the purpose of preventing or avoiding other harm to person or property. So, basically, it is not an offence even if you do something with the knowledge that it is likely to cause harm. A good example is people who are doing surgeries. Now, if there is a surgery, n number of things can go wrong. There can be a reaction, the anesthesia might not work or there can be a subsequent infection and the person might even get killed. So, a surgeon who is performing the surgery he does not have any malice thought. He is not performing the surgery to kill the patient, but he knows that it is also likely that in certain number of cases, the patient might be brought to harm. But that harm is very small as compared to the harm that would come or ensue if the surgery is not done. So, in this case, because the surgeon is not having a mens rea, he does not have an intention to harm the patient and he is doing something that in certain cases can cause a harm, this act will be excusable. So, nothing is an offence merely by reason of its being done with the knowledge that it is likely to cause harm, but only if it is done without any criminal intention to cause harm and in good faith for the purpose of preventing or avoiding other harm to person or property. Explanation, it is a question of fact in such a case whether the harm to be prevented or avoided was of such a nature and so imminent as to justify or excuse the risk of doing the act with the knowledge that it was likely to cause harm. That is, the medicine should not be more dangerous than the disease itself. If you know that a harm can occur to a person and the quantum of that harm is x and if you do something that causes a much greater harm or basically you are not able to justify the extent of intervention that you did, in those cases you will not be protected by this section. So, it is only applicable if it is done without any criminal intention to cause harm and in good faith and when the uh, risk of doing the act can be justified. Illustrations A. The captain of a steam vessel suddenly and without any fault or negligence on his part finds himself in such a position that before he can stop his vessel he must inevitably run down a boat B with 20 or 30 passengers on board unless he changes the course of his vessel and that by changing his course he must incur the risk of running down a boat C with only two passengers on board which he may possibly clear. So, in this case A the captain of the ship is in a position that if he does not do anything the boat will collide with or the ship will collide with boat B with 20 or 30 passengers. 
the other option is to change the course and if he changes the course of the vessel then it is possible that the ship may collide with boat C. But this being a smaller boat has only two passengers on board. And it is also possible that the ship does not collide with boat C. So, he is taking this risk well knowing that this risk might also entail collision with boat C and probably death of these two passengers. But this is justified because the other alternative is collision with boat B which has 20 or 30 passengers on board. So, in this case A knows that he might cause harm to boat C and its passengers, but still he is altering the course without any intention to run down the boat C. He does not want to collide with boat C. His intention is just to save his ship from any collisions. So, he does not have the intention to run down boat C. He is acting in good faith for the purpose of avoiding the danger to the passengers in the boat B. And so, he is not guilty of an offence though he may run down the boat C by doing an act which he knew was likely to cause that effect. If it is found as a matter of fact that the danger which he intended to avoid was such as to excuse him in incurring the risk of running down C. Another example is A in a great fire pulls down houses in order to prevent the conflagration from spreading. So, basically the city or the town is in is on fire and the houses are getting burnt one by one. And to stop that A is destroying a few houses, so that the fire is unable to move to other houses. So, he does this with the intention in good faith of saving human life or property. Here if it is found that the harm to be prevented was of such a nature and so imminent as to excuse A's act, then we will say that A is not guilty of the offence. But here again, if A or his or her lawyer will have to prove that the harm to be prevented was of such a nature and imminent as to excuse A's act. So, basically if it turns out that the fire was not going to spread, it was a very small fire and to control that fire breaking down of 3 or 4 houses was not necessary, then A will not be excused. But if it turns out that the fire was so large that it was necessary to destroy some of the houses in its way, so that it does not spread, only then will, will A get the benefit of this section. Then section 82, act of a child under 7 years of age. So, this is the infancy clause. Nothing is an offence which is done by a child under 7 years of age, because the child does not have the capability to form a guilty mind or mens rea. The child does not form mens rea and so the child will get an exception. So, nothing is an offence which is done by a child under 7 years of age. Then we have act of a child above 7 and under 12 of immature understanding. Now, above 7 the law considers that uh, children will develop certain understanding, but in certain cases if the child is does not have a mature understanding, then this section will apply. Nothing is an offence which is done by a child above 7 years of age and under 12 who has not attained sufficient maturity of understanding to judge of the nature and consequences of his conduct on that occasion. So, probably if the child was say distressed or if the child was under pressure or if it so turns out that the child just did not understand what he was doing, he did not understand the consequences of his action even though he is above 7 years of age, but if he is below 12 years of age, then he will get the benefit of this exception. Act of a person of unsound mind. Nothing is an offence which is done by a person who at the time of doing it by reason of unsoundness of mind is incapable of knowing the nature of the act, 
or that he is doing what is either wrong or contrary to law. So nothing is an offense if the person does not have a sound mind. If there is say a psychiatric or a psychological issue or be, because of certain kinds of distresses or provocations, then if the person has an unsound mind, then this section will apply. Act of a person incapable of judgment by reason of intoxication caused against his will. So, if the person has taken the intoxicant, whether alcohol or certain drugs voluntarily, then this section will not apply. It will only apply if the intoxication has been caused against his will. So, it says nothing is an offense which is done by a person who at the time of doing it is by reason of intoxication incapable of knowing the nature of the act or that he is doing what is either wrong or contrary to law, provided that the thing which intoxicated him was administered to him without his knowledge or against his will. Offence requiring a particular intent or knowledge committed by one who is intoxicated. Now, this section says, in cases where an act done is not an offence, unless done with a particular knowledge or intent, that is with a particular uh, level of mens rea, a person who does the act in a state of intoxication shall be liable to be dealt with as if he had the same knowledge as he would have had if he had not been intoxicated. Unless the thing which intoxicated him was administered to him without his knowledge or against his will. So, basically if there is an act which is categorized an offence only when the person who is doing the act has the particular knowledge or intent. Then a person who is intoxicated and this intoxication is not without his knowledge and not against his will. That is basically this person has knowingly taken the drug, alcohol or other intoxicant. Then this person will be dealt in the same manner as if he had the same knowledge as he would have had if he had not been intoxicated. So, basically the benefit of being intoxicated or the benefit of not having the capability to make the proper decisions because you were in a drugged state will not be available if you took the drugs, alcohol or the intoxicant out of your own volition, out of your own free will, out of your own knowledge. You will get this benefit only if the intoxicant was administered without your will or without your knowledge. Next section 87, act not intended and not known to be likely to cause death or grievous hurt done by consent. So, basically if there is an act that is done by consent and the act is not intended to cause death or grievous hurt, that is if by consent you are doing something that can result in death, you will not get this uh, exemption. But if you are doing something that is not known or is, uh, uh, or is uh, uh, unlikely to cause death or grievous hurt and it is done by consent, only then you will have the benefit of this section. So, it says nothing which is not intended to cause death or grievous hurt and which is not known by the doer to be likely to cause death or grievous hurt is an offence by reason of any harm which it may cause or be intended by the doer to cause to any person above 18 years of age. Here 18 years of age is important because only these people can give consent. Whether expressed or implied to suffer that harm or by reason of any harm which it may be known by the doer to be likely to cause to any such person who has consented to take the risk of that harm. Examples, things like playing. So, for instance, if people are playing uh, kabaddi and during this playing of kabaddi, somebody suffers a fracture, then this person cannot say that, okay, I suffered fracture because of such and such people who were holding me and so, they should be uh, punished for grievous hurt. This will not happen because when you 
consented to play kabaddi with these people whether this consent was explicit or whether this consent was implied and everybody knows that kabaddi is unlikely to cause death or grievous hurt because a large number of us play kabaddi and do not get hurt so if this is the situation then the person because of whom this person got a fracture will not be held accountable it is not an offense another illustration is a and z agree to fence with each other for amusement so here again they are playing the game of fencing for their own enjoyment and this agreement implies the consent of each to suffer any harm which in the course of such fencing may be caused without foul play now here again it should not be foul play and if a while playing fairly hurts z a commits no offense section 88 act not intended to cause death or done by consent in good faith for a person's benefit nothing which is not intended to cause death is an offense by reason of any harm which it may cause or be intended by the doer to cause or be known by the doer to be likely to cause to any person for whose benefit it is done in good faith and who has given a consent whether express or implied to suffer that harm or to take the risk of that harm illustration a a surgeon knowing that a particular operation is likely to cause the death of z who suffers under the painful complaint but not intending to cause z's death and intending in good faith z's benefit performs that operation on z with z's consent then a has committed no offense so what are the things that are required here this should not be an act that is intended to cause death you should not be having this intention to cause death and there should be consent and the act should be done in good faith for the person's benefit so if all of these things are there then the person will get the benefit of this exception section 89 act done in good faith for benefit of child or insane person by or by consent of guardian now here law states that because children and insane people are unable to give their own consent so if their guardians are doing something in good faith for their benefit or the guardians are giving consent to somebody to do something in good faith for their benefit and even if the child or the insane person comes to a harm because of these acts then to there will not be an offense because there was no mens rea the only intention was to act in the best interest of the child or the insane person and with all due precautions if something goes wrong then there will not be an offense so the section states nothing which is done in good faith for the benefit of a person under 12 years of age so in this case the child is defined to be under 12 years of age or of unsound mind by or by consent either express or implied of the guardian or other person having lawful charge of that person is an offense by reason of any harm which it may cause or be intended by the doer to cause or be known by the doer to be likely to cause to that person provided that this exception shall not extend to the intentional causing of death or to the attempting to cause death so in this case you cannot say that because there is an insane person and so to to make his or her life easy you are trying to give him death then this exception does not hold this exception shall not extend to the doing of anything which the person knows it uh, which the person doing it knows to be likely to cause death for any purpose other than preventing of death or grievous hurt or the curing of any grievous disease of or infirmity so anything 
that can cause death will not be permitted under this exception except if it is done to prevent death or grievous hurt or to treat certain disease that this exception shall not extend to the voluntary causing of grievous hurt or to the attempting to cause grievous hurt unless it be for the purpose of preventing death or grievous hurt or the curing of any grievous disease or infirmity that this exception shall not extend to the abatement of any offence to the committing of which offence it would not extend so it does not also extend to abatement of offences illustration a in good faith for his child's benefit without the child's consent because the child cannot give a consent has his child cut for the stone by a surgeon knowing it to be likely that the operation will cause the child's death but not intending to cause the child's death so a does not want to cause the child's death but there is a stone in this child and this stone has to be removed and the surgery may result in the child's death so even with this knowledge if a is allowing this surgery to happen then a is within the exception in as much as his object was the cure of the child so in this case a does not have a mens rea a is not trying to bring the child to harm a is only trying to help the child or to treat the child or to get the child get treated so in this case this exception will apply section 90 consent known to be given under fear or misconception a consent is not such a consent as is intended by any section of this code if the consent is given by a person under fear of injury or under a misconception of fact and if the person doing the act knows or has reason to believe that the consent was given in consequence of such fear or misconception or if there is a consent of an insane person or the consent of a child so if the consent is given by a person who from unsoundness of mind or intoxication is unable to understand the nature and consequence of that to which he gives his consent or unless the contrary appears from the context if the consent is given by a person who is under 12 years of age then all of these consents will not be treated as a consent because in these cases the person gave this consent because of a fear of injury or because of a misconception of fact or because the person did not have the capability to give the consent so in all of these cases the law will say that there was no consent at all so this thing has to be very clear so whenever you have an exception that says that a consent was provided it means that the conception should have been a proper consent section 91 exclusion of acts which are offenses independently of harm caused the exceptions in the three previous sections 87 88 and 89 do not extend to acts which are offenses independently of any harm which they may cause or intend or be intended to cause or be known to be likely to cause to the person giving the consent or on whose behalf the consent is given for example causing miscarriage or abortion unless it is caused in good faith for the purpose of saving the life of the woman is an offense independently of any harm which it may cause or be intended to cause to, to the woman therefore it is not an offense by reason of such harm and the consent of the woman or of her guardian to the causing of such miscarriage does not justify the act what it says is if the act is an offense by itself then it does not matter whether or not the consent was given or not in the case of abortions unless it is done for saving the life or health of the woman involved the abortion is an offense in itself so it is immaterial whether the woman gave or her guardian gave a consent or not 
because abortion is a crime if it is not done for these medical purposes. Then act done in good faith for benefit of a person without consent. Nothing is an offence by reason of any harm which it may cause to a person for whose benefit it is done in good faith even without that person's consent. So even if you are not taking the person's consent but you are doing it in good faith for the benefit of that person then you will get the benefit of this exemption. If the circumstances are such that it is impossible for that person to signify consent or if that person is incapable of giving consent and has no guardian or other person in lawful charge of him from whom it is possible to obtain consent in time for the thing to be done with benefit. Provided that this exception shall not extend to the intentional causing of death or the attempting to cause death, this exception shall not extend to the doing of anything which the person doing it knows to be likely to cause death for any purpose other than preventing of death or grievous hurt or the curing of any grievous disease or infirmity. It, it will not extend to voluntarily causing of hurt or to the attempting to cause hurt for any purpose other than the preventing of death or hurt and it shall not extend to the abatement of any offence to the committing of which offence it would not extend. For example, there is a person who is riding a horse and gets thrown from the horse and becomes insensible and to protect the life of that person a surgeon needs to perform a surgery on that person and the surgeon is not intending to kill Z is acting in good faith for Z's benefit and the surgeon performs the surgery and the surgery is performed before Z recovers his power of judging for himself. So, in this case A the surgeon has not committed any offence because he is acting in the best interest of the person on whom the surgery is performed even though this surgery is being performed without a consent. Next Z is carried off by a tiger, A fires at the tiger knowing it to be likely that the shot may kill Z but not intending to kill Z. Basically A is firing at the tiger because he is thinking that if I shoot the tiger then probably Z will be saved. But because Z and the tiger are very close by then it is possible that the shot may in place of hitting the, the tiger it hits Z. But because A is not intending to kill Z and is acting in good faith for Z's benefit. So, even if in the process he shoots Z and Z dies then to A does, has not committed an offence because there is no mens rea here. Another example is A a surgeon sees a child suffer an accident which is likely to prove fatal unless an, uh, unless an operation is immediately performed. Now here again if there is no time to apply to the child's guardian then the surgeon can directly perform the operation without waiting for any consent because he is acting in the good faith he is acting for the child's benefit. So there is no offence there is no mens rea. A is in a house which is on fire with Z a child. People below hold out a blanket. A drops the child from the house top knowing it to be likely that the fall may kill the child but he is not intending to kill the child and is intending in good faith the child's benefit because he is thinking that if the child falls on the blanket then probably the, the child will be saved otherwise the child will burn in the fire. Now in this process even if the child gets killed A has committed no offence. Now there is also an explanation that mere pecuniary benefit that is benefit in the form of cash or kind is not a benefit within the meaning of these sections 88, 89 and 92. So there has to be a larger benefit. Communication made in good faith. No communication made in good faith is an offence by reason of any harm to the person to whom it is made if it is made for the benefit of that person. That is if a doctor or a surgeon 
communicate communicates to a patient his opinion that the person is going to die and the person dies because of the shock of hearing this news so in this case the surgeon or the doctor has not committed an offense because he was making the communication in good faith act to which a person is compelled by threats so except murder and offenses against the state punishable with death with these two exceptions if there is something that is being done because of a compulsion of an of a threat then it will not be an offense so for example a person seized by a gang of decoits and forced by threat of instant death to do a thing which is an offense by law for example a smith compelled to take his tools and to force the door of a house for the decoits to enter and plunder is is entitled to the benefit of this exception provided that there has to be an imminent threat so in this case the smith is not acting out of his own free will but is acting under this compulsion and so in this case it is not an offense act causing slight harm so in this case the legal maxim is de minimi non curat lex the law does not take care of trifles so if there is an act that causes a harm but it is such a small harm that no person of ordinary sense and temper would complain of such harm then it will not be considered to be an offense then things done in private defense nothing is an offense which is done in the exercise of the right of private defense right of private defense of the body and of the property so here the right to private defense extends to that of the body and that of property and body means your own body or body of any other person <coughs> similarly the property can be movable or immovable property right of private defense against the act of a person of unsound mind so if there is somebody of an unsound mind who is trying to kill you so in that case you can in your self defense harm or even kill that person for example z under the influence of madness attempts to kill a z is guilty of no offense because he is acting under the influence of madness so z does not have a mens rea but a has the same right of private defense which he would have if z were sane so even though z is mad but a has the same right of private defense as if z were acting in his correct senses a enters by night a house which is legally entitled to enter z in good faith taking a for a house breaker attacks a now in this case z by attacking a under this misconception because this is a mistake of fact so z is committing no offense but a has the same right of private defense against z which he would have had if z were not acting under that misconception acts against which there is no right of private defense so there is no right of private defense against an act which does not reasonably cause the apprehension of death or of grievous hurt if done or attempted to be done by a public servant acting in good faith under color of his office though that act may not be strictly justifiable by law so basically this section says that if something is being done by a public servant or if something is being done by the direction of a public servant then <clears throat> you do not have the benefit of these exceptions similarly you do not have the right of private defense in cases where there is time to have recourse to protection of the public authorities so basically this is saying that if you can go to the public authorities for defense then you should go to them and you will not have the right of private defense because things are not urgent now when the right of private defense of the body extends to causing death 
so in certain cases while doing defense of the bo uh, of the body you can even cause death of the other person in what situations if the assault as may reasonably cause the apprehension death death will otherwise be a consequence of such assault so if the other person is attacking you and if you have a reasonable apprehension that if you do not kill that person that person will kill you then you have all the rights to kill that person or in place of death if if you have a reasonable apprehension that the other person will cause you a grievous harm so in that case also you can kill that person if there is an assault with the intention of committing rape then you can kill that person an assault with the intention of gratifying unnatural lust you can kill that person an assault with the intention of kidnapping or abducting again you can kill the other person an assault with the intention of wrongfully confining a person under such circumstances which may reasonably cause him to apprehend that he will be unable to have recourse to the public authorities for his release here again you have the right to kill the other person an act of throwing or administering acid or an attempt to throw or administer acid which may reasonably cause the apprehension that grievous hurt will otherwise be the consequence so these general exceptions extend to the extent of allowing you to kill another person so even things such as killing of people are permitted under these circumstances when such right extends to causing any harm other than death so if the offense be not of any of the descriptions enumerated in the last preceding section then the right of private defense of the body does not extend to the voluntary causing of death to the assailant but does extend under the restrictions mentioned in section 99 to the voluntary causing to the assailant of any harm other than death then you have commencement and continuance of the right of private defense of the body so you have these rights from the time when the attempt or the threat starts till the time this apprehension of danger continues so for all this time you have the right to uh, have the private defense of the body then in certain cases when you are defending your property now this is not your life or your body or somebody else's body but here we are talking about defense of property but even while you are defending your property you have the right to cause death in certain cases if there is robbery in your house if there is house breaking in night time if there is mischief by fire committed on any building tent or vessel which building tent or vessel is used as a human dwelling or as a place for the custody or of property or theft mischief or house trespass under such circumstances as may reasonably cause apprehension that death or grievous hurt will be the consequence so in these cases even while defending your property you can kill somebody and you will not be charged when such right extends to causing any harm other than death so basically these are those situations where uh, the things are not that imminent so in those cases you can cause any harm other than death then again commencement and continuance of the right so again in this case it says that the this right will start from the time that the attempt or the commission or the threat starts and will be there till the time that this threat extinguishes so for all of that this right of private defense of your property then right of private defense against deadly assault when there is risk of harm to innocent person if in the exercise of the right of private defense against an assault which reasonably causes the apprehension of death the defender be so situated that he cannot effectually exercise that right without risk of harm to an innocent person his right of private defense extends to the running of that risk so you in in uh, Uh, in your private defense you can even kill an innocent person it's not that the person who was causing the attack that you can kill you can also kill innocent people and you will 
be having the uh, benefit of this exception. Example is attacked by a mob who attempt to murder him. He cannot effectually exercise his right of private defense without firing on the mob and he cannot fire without risk of harming young children who are mingled with the mob. A commits no offense if by so firing he harms any of the children. So basically, when we talk about these general exceptions, these are certain exceptions that are provided to everybody by law, protecting them against being charged for a crime. Because they say that there are certain acts that are bona fide acts that are justifiable or that can be excused. And these acts uh, and the, the, the commissioning of these acts must not result in a penalty. So, these are the general exceptions in the IPC. So, that is all for today. Thank you for your attention. Jai Hind.